Hello, I'm Chris Harbard. And I'm Mary Sia, and welcome folks to our Southwest Wings online speaker series, holiday series, and we're so proud to uh, welcome and introduce our next speaker, Jim Kowick. Yeah, Jim may be familiar to people who've attended our summer festivals. He is a grassland plant expert, and uh, I have to recommend his most fabulous book, it's called Grassland Plant ID for Everyone, but it also has a nice little catchy subtitle. It's for everyone except folks that take boring technical stuff too seriously. Woohoo! And I have to say that's exactly what it is, because this book is not only full of fabulous illustrations, uh, photographs by Dale Armstrong, but also it features both the wit and wisdom of Jim Coeek. And that's what we're going to hear a little bit of today. So at the end of the talk, there will be um, time for questions and answers. So you will see there's a question and answer feature um, as part of the Zoom. And if you could please type in any questions you have there. And then at the end, we will ask Jim to answer them. We may ask you to answer those questions directly. Yeah. Well, I also just want to, one second, just invite some of the folks out there. Can you type in? where you're tuning in from us uh, to us today just to give us a sense of who's coming in and landing with us here today as a group that'd be great and just a quick hello uh you can always do that in the chat box throughout as well yeah. yay joan from green valley we've got risa from colorado springs patricia from tucson robert from here from hartford hi hey. robert hey robert and uh, Edith from Tucson too, I know that's, that's great. And more and more, Massimo from Tucson. And Betsy. Cool, Betsy, thank you. Oh, Phyllis yeah. from Boise, Boise, Idaho. That's some Boise? distance. Boise? Boise, yeah, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> uh, Albert, Al Dwayne from Albuquerque, wow, this is great. Sarah, Sarah from Tucson. Tucson. Prescott, cool, we Gregory were just there. From Prescott, yep, we were there a few a days ago. A couple weeks ago, that was nice. Scottsdale, beautiful. Okay, <laughs> so we've got folks from all over uh, joining us today, Jim. And Lovely. we're really happy to see y'all. So sit back, relax, grab yourself a nice cup of something, and enjoy the show. Over to you, Jim. Santa Fe, over to you. There we go. Thank you. And Chris, appreciate that great inter introduction. Um, I, I, I like the part about the wit and the wisdom, but if it was. <laughs> If it was about my wisdom, I'm afraid it'd be a really short book. So luckily there's some pictures and other things in there. We'll see you on the other side, Jim. All right. Thank you, folks. Um, appreciate y'all tuning in. Am I supposed to hit share screen now? This is pretty well rehearsed. I guess I'll do that. You could do that if you like, whenever you like. Okay, let's do that. Oh. Oh, here we go. Start. Oh, son of a gun. We're off. <laughs> there we go. How's that working? That's perfect. Anyway, folks, thank you all for, for tuning in. I know everybody's busy, and um, people here are here from all over, so we're going to stay kind of general today. And um, I don't know where you were, but I, where, you, where you woke up at this morning, but it was 13 degrees here in Canelo. And uh, we had a whopping six hundredths of rain from this last big storm that, that went through. And for those of us in Southern Arizona, we're, we're actually celebrating six hundredths of rain. And um, as my buddy Peter Gerlach likes to say, um, you, you gotta be careful when you're measuring those kind of quantities because most of that's probably teardrops in the rain gauge, so. At any rate, I'm not, I don't know much about birds. I know a little bit about plants. So um, we're going to stay kind of general today. We'll do a little bit of grassland stuff and some plant IDs. And please, if you have any questions, more than happy to, to answer them. I uh, just put this slide up. My friend Dale Armstrong takes almost every picture except for the, except for the two that are fuzzy. And I can take the credit for those. But there's a lot of ways of looking at pictures. Um, I put this one up because I really like it. We, we couldn't find a place for it. Some people think it's a little dark, 
But when I look at it, I see the flower stalks. Do you see this cursor? I hope so. Um, I see the flower stalk of a bear grass plant, Nolina microcarpa. Now, a lot of y'all probably see the bird there, which I believe is a raven, but like I said, I don't know much about birds, probably a Chihuahuan raven. Um, and I was just reading another book by a friend of mine, Ralph Walt, who wrote a great book about the natural, natural history of uh, the San Pedro River. And I just read that ravens have the same brain to body size proportion that a, um, that a chimpanzee has, but their brains are denser. So there's actually probably more going on there. And I thought that was pretty interesting. So thanks Ralph, that's a good book you put together. Let's go to the grasslands. And that looks like a grassland to me. This picture is taken and I'll give you some locations here for people that want to maybe follow up. This is Las Cienegas, just north of Sonoida. And we could spend the whole time probably talking about this one picture here, but that would get pretty boring for everybody. So we're not, we're not gonna do that. Um, this is, there's a lot going on here. Grasslands, I like to think of as kind of like the middle section where everything comes together. You take your low, hot, stinking deserts and you start adding a little bit of moisture and then you add a little bit of cooler temperatures and you add a whole lot of wind and you end up with a grassland. You things gradually change from the low Sonoran deserts to the north and the, you know, a little bit lusher in the desert scrub, next step lusher is going to be your grasslands. If you started higher than us in, let's say, a Ponderosa forest or something higher and you took away moisture and you took away uh, and you added some temperature, uh, those places would eventually become grasslands too. So the grasslands kind of like this big meeting place where it all comes together. And you can see there's a couple characteristics in the grasslands. And I'm gonna ask you to remember some of this for later on, but you can see the main characteristic, the main thing that to me defines a grassland are large number of individual species of individuals and large numbers of individual of, of individuals and species. You have a little bit of cane beard grass right down in the left hand corner, and that rolls into some kind of grama grass, probably um, spruce top or one of the one of those gramas. You have clumps down here. Of course, your grasses are different in the bottom, and uh, where you're getting some protection, you don't see much large vegetation. Where you're getting the, the, the trees are down in the bottom swales that catch a little bit more moisture and catch a break from the wind. And in one of my worst occupational days that I've ever spent in my life, I was filming for an animal planet show, I think it was, called My Backyard. And it was just horrible because they sent, I don't know what else to call her, the nature babe over with the guy who was supposedly the naturalist. And they said, well, how come there's nothing in the grassland? And I just wanted to scream, what do you mean there's nothing? Look at all these plants here. But they meant there's no forest, there's no trees. And I kid you not, the answer, if you ever have a chance to watch that, my backyard habitat in Sonoya, the, um, the naturalist said, there's nothing there because there's nothing there. But when we plant things, there will be, there will be something there. So that's the kind of intelligent thing. I just went under the bushes and, and got away and bit my lips. I didn't say anything. Anyway, so that's the grasslands near Sonoya. This is important. This is the one I'm going to ask you to remember. And I really hope you can see this cursor. I don't know if you can or not. But this is, you know, a five or six foot square patch. And you see there's one in the left hand side. There's probably blue grama. And the center is cane bear grass. There's one sprig of maybe side oak grama right there. That looks to the right of that is going to be sprangle top. And it doesn't matter these individual grasses. My point is you're looking at about a five foot square patch of, of grasses. And there's four or five individual species in there. And that's really important because probably each of these grasses out there has a particular 
function in the whole ecological system. It feeds a larvae from this cat caterpillar or this bug eats the seeds or this you know, bird comes along and takes, the, takes it. So it's important that there's a tremendous amount of uh, diversity in the, in the grasslands. And that, I'm gonna ask you to remember that because we'll come back to why that's important later on. Now, take a sip of dollar store tequila here this morning. When we started working on the book that Chris was nice enough to mention, the first thing we realized it was going to be a grass identification book. And the first thing we did when we went out and bent over um, is we realized the grassland is way more than grasses. And yes, there's grasses in the picture, but that little blue flower is one called Arizona Blue Eyes. And I'll, I'll stay with, I don't know if y'all are more comfortable working in common names or botanical names, but I'm going to stay working in common names. Um, I had an old friend live down in Bisbee. Name was Dave Epley, and he ran something called Arizona Cactus and Succulent Research Institute. And he was quite a character, but he used to say that botanical names should be used to clear things up, not confuse people. So we're going to stay with common names right now. At any rate, so that's Arizona blue curls in the middle. And it's just a little wildflower that grows. Those are about dime-sized flowers, blue flowers that grow there. And it's a very pretty little plant. Okay. There's strategies that plants use to, to cope with our conditions, which as before I said, and I think of the grassland, I'm thinking of hot dry spells, followed by hopefully some wet spells in the summer and maybe cold freezing temperatures. I've had 28 freezes so far in December and that, that's a lot even for us, but you can kind of see. So this plant I brought up because the common name for this one is San Pedro Daisy and nice little daisy-like yellow flower on it. The leaves are very rough. They feel like sandpaper which is a great mechanism for conserving water loss. If you were to put your hand on them, it feels like maybe 100 or 120 grit sandpaper. Um, but the main characteristic of this plant that you can't see, if you were to dig this plant up, the root system, it's, it's almost tuber, it is tuberous, uh, more like a corm than a tuber, but we're not gonna split hairs right now. Um, and that's used for water, water storage. So the plant comes up in the springtime, it grows, it flowers, and then with the summer rains, except for last year, um, it stores moisture and waits until the ground warms up again in, in the following spring. And that's a great mechanism. And we are probably the king of tubers around here. There's an awful lot of plants that take advantage of the moisture when it comes down and store it until the conditions are right to grow again. That's a great way to deal with long dry spells and long wet spells. And speaking of long dry spells, um, this was definitely, I've lived in this particular location for the past 30 years, and this was by far the driest summer that we've ever had. And talking to friends that work on the Santa Rita research station south of Tucson, they've been keeping weather records for over 90 years. And this is the driest summer that they've ever had. So we're getting on historical drought. And if we want to talk more about it in the question and answers, we can do that. But um, I'm expecting if there's not some better precipitation uh, this winter into the spring, I'm thinking that a lot of these grasses, the native grasses, especially shallow rooted ones, uh, curly mesquite, spruce top grama, slender grama, they just don't have the reserves to make it through another hot, dry year this year. A lot of them didn't even flower last year. Okay, we might be getting off subject here, and I know we got limited time, so uh, and I can't even blame anybody for questions because it's just me so far. So at any rate, there's San Pedro Daisy and uh, pretty little flower. One of the other things that we have to deal with in the grasslands and all over southeast Arizona is a little thing called caliche. 
Kodichi is nothing more than than rain coming down and raining and dissolving some limestone and leaching that that calcium carbonate, I think, um, down into the soils and making a very alkaline, a lot of the times impermeable layer. And the reason soils are very, very, very important and they really help in plant ID, there are plants that prefer this kind of ground and there are plants that prefer to be out of it. And by looking at your ground, it can kind of point you in the direction of what plants might be there. So that's, that's really important. The soils are very, very important. Okay, so I don't think we're growing corn in this kind of area, but you can kind of see the grasses up on top. And then there's probably about maybe a six or seven inch layer. And then there's a, looks like an impermeable layer of caliche right there, or mostly impermeable. And that's as far as plant roots are going to go down into that. So if I'm in a, a caliche or an alkaline layer, um, I know there's a certain set of plants that can, tend to prefer that. And I also know that people who like to complain about being in nasty white dirt, uh, from, from the work I do and rangeland assessments, when you're in this kind of caliche soil, that's actually the most diverse plant communities that I see. So there are native plants that are adapted to this kind of, these kind of conditions and do really, really well here. Okay, um, Dale did not take this picture. I took this picture and it's another one that we could spend probably 45 minutes talking about just by itself. So this picture is taken on the west side of the Huachuca Mountains at about, oh, maybe 5,100 feet. And you're looking towards the Santa Rita's and you know that picture is not taken this year because you can see all the snow up in the Santa Rita Mountains. Mostly alligator junipers in the foreground. Grasses, grasses are the carpet that tie everything in together. But you can also see in the lower right-hand corner, there's little yellow fruits from a choya cactus. And again, these, I would call this grasslands. You know, you're getting into the woodlands. There's alligator juniper, there's, there's emery oak, there's white oak down in the canyons. Um, but again, this is the land where it all comes together. And that's why I like it so much. There's cactus from the lower elevations. There are some succulents that are tolerant of these conditions. And then there's the, the forest and the trees that are more typical from higher elevations, and it all comes together here. But the main reason this, this slide is important to me, and I think we should look at it in a little more depth, is if you will look at maybe that first range of hills here, after this, the ones right in the center of the picture, and draw a line straight across visually, okay? Everybody, when you talk about, when I said I was 13 degrees this morning, I'm sure half of y'all out there were going, well, what's your elevation? Um, elevation is overrated. Location is not, <laughs> situation is not overrated. If you look at the north side of all these slopes, they're all wooded, mostly emery oak, a little bit of alligator juniper, some white oak, but mostly emery oak. If you look at the south side, it's all grasslands. South sides are warmer. North sides are protected from the wind. Um, so if you just draw a line straight across visually, you're going to see in the exact same elevation, two almost completely plant different, com different plant communities. So that's something to keep in mind here. All right. There's a nice clear picture. Getting back to plant ID, one of the first things I do with grasses, if I'm trying to figure out what a grass is, one of the very first things that I'll do is try to pull it out of the ground. Um, sometimes you have to be careful <laughs> where you're doing this. Some people are not very appreciative if you pull it out of the ground. But if you pull it out of the ground easily and it has a fairly limited root system, it's probably an annual. And annuals are like rock stars. 
they come up easy, they flower, they reproduce, they produce seed, and then they die. It's a quick life cycle. Perennials take their time. They'll germinate. It might be a year or two in a grassy situation, depending on the year, um, before they flower, and then they come back the next year. And they come back the year after that. So it's very important. Perennial grasses are, are it's important for in a healthy grassland to have a, a very high percentage of perennial grasses. Annuals are great. They get the ball started. That's important. But this one um, came out of the ground easily and it had a burr-like seed <laughs> that sticks in your thumb and bleeds when you pull it out. So to me, that became sand burr. That was a pretty easy ID. Okay, I love this shot right here. Believe it or not, that's my hand. That's Dale through the miracle of black and white photography. I know I look like an old sharecropper or something. But here are two grandma grasses that look very similar, but there are ways to tell them apart. The one up the, on the top is blue grandma, and you can see all the seed heads in that, and it comes up with a little curl and their seeds right to the end. The ones right below it are hairy grandma, and hairy grandma always has this spike on the end of it. They grow in kind of different conditions. So this is getting back to the soil. Blue grandma likes silty swales and hairy grandma will take shallower soil profiles and uh, rockier slopes. You'll usually see it on rocky slopes. Sometimes you'll see them growing in the same spot, but not usually. So going back to the soils, that helps, um, that helps with this, the ID. But that has nothing to do with why I like this picture. Why I like this picture is um, you can see calluses on the end of my fingertips there. And that means I've been playing a lot of music. So that's a good thing. If you look really close at that second finger down, you'll see two strings. And, and that means, hey, there's a lot of mandolin playing going on. So that's always a good time. It means I was probably doing that instead of working. All right. Uh, just some real basic, we're going to stay really basic on this ID stuff. I've never had a botany class in my life, so I've had to develop ways to, to identify plants based on other than, than technical diagnostic characteristics. Um, my main method is to talk to people who know more than I do, and that's my favorite method. I've gotten a lot of really good help from people who are willing to share what they know with me. And, and I'm happy to pass that on. So here's a juniper. It's obviously a juniper growing in the hills of the Huachuca Mountains. And here's a juniper. And the growth form looks a little different between this one and this one. And the color is a little bit different, sorry. Um, but the color just comes, it's just wax that's built up on the, on the needles or leaves, whatever you want to call them on a juniper. So the color dis difference is not that critical. Um, the soil difference can be, can be critical. And seeing this Ocotillo here and tells me that I'm probably in a fairly alkaline area, but the real way to tell these two junipers apart, it's pretty easy, is to go to the next slide. And this is from the first one, the one that was the bluer green and look at the bark on that sucker, and that looks a lot like, looks an awful lot like an alligator to me. So believe it or not, that one is alligator juniper. This other plant to the right is a very cool succulent that grows up a little higher elevation. It's one called mountain yucca. It used to be yucca shoddyi, but I think they've changed that, and I don't know what the new name is, something like yucca madrensis or something. Huh? Not sure, so I probably shouldn't even go there. But let's go back to the junipers for a second. You have alligator on that one, and that's the alligator juniper. And the second plant has very long, striated, shaggy bark, and that's one seed juniper. Some people call it shaggy bark juniper, but probably one seed juniper. So without looking at any foliage at all, alligator juniper, 
and one seed juniper. And there's only two junipers that grow down here in Southeast Arizona. Let's go back to this plant for a second. That's uh, Mountain Yucca. Um, one of the cool things about this plant, and, and maybe I should have said this earlier, when I look at a lot of these plants, I'm thinking, what can they be used for? And I know that a lot of the way plant books are supposed to be done is there's always a little bit of, at the very last line, it will say, indigenous peoples use this plant for hemorrhoids, bad moods, and, um, and brain headaches. I don't know, whatever they used it for. You make a poultice, and they made poultices and applied it. And I don't know about y'all, but it's been several years since I've made a poultice for anything. And most of us, if we're sick, we have other places we go and get medicine. So I think the biggest use for these native plants is in our own landscapes. That's when where most of us are actually going to use them and where we can benefit from them and where we can benefit wildlife very, very easily with no extra effort, no extra money, no extra time, the same effort that it, that it costs to plant a ornamental plant. You can be planting a native plant and, and get a lot more for your buck. But we'll get into that a little bit. Let's go back to plant ID. Uh, I tend to get off a little bit on tangents and I like that very much. At any rate, um, so mountain yucca, the reason I got it thought about it landscaping, it's one of the few succulents that actually likes shade. So if you have a shady condition and you're looking for a plant to put in there, um, that's a good one. There's your one seed juniper. That's a, uh, another yucca. That's not a great grassland. That looks more like desert scrub, but the leaf form on that is very similar to the mountain yucca that we were looking at a second ago. So how can you tell them apart? Well, that has some hairs on its leaves, but if you look closely, your mountain yucca has a red edge on the end. Easy, diagnose, easy diagnostic characteristic. You don't have to get into details about flower parts. Um, just an easy way to tell them apart. Okay. Two kinds of mesquite in this area. And mesquite are very, very important plants. Um, they can be very, very beneficial. They can be very harmful. But when I look at the mesquite, on the left, that's your native mesquite. Velvet mesquite's a good name for it. When I look at a mesquite leaf, I think here's a leaf that all the unnecessary parts have been removed. If you can picture that whole leaf structure greened in, it looks like a plant from a cooler, wetter climate. But if you get rid of all the unnecessary parts, you have a mesquite leaf. And that leaf form is super popular it, it's really, it's probably the dominant leaf form in native shrubs and trees in the Southwest. Acacias have it, um, mimosas have it, mesquite has it. I mean, there's a tremendous amount of plants that have it. The plant on the right is Texas honey mesquite. And you can tell just by the leaf form that they're different. And what happens, because I spent a lot of time lately on mesquite eradication projects. Um, some work better than others, but it gets very, very, very confusing. The Texas honey mesquite, believe it or not, um, is from Texas and places east of here. And the farther west you go, the more you get into your velvet mesquite and you have all this no man's land, this never, never no man's land that happens in Eastern Arizona and New Mexico, where there seems to be like a fusion of the two and the, and the mesquites aren't big and tree-like, they're kind of short and scrubby and it's just a mess. So, but you can tell by the leaves, this is two extreme examples, regular velvet mesquite on the left, Texas honey on the right. And no, cattle did not bring in mesquite, mesquite have been here forever. So let's just get that out of the way. Here's a beautiful plant. Now, who doesn't want that in their front yard or backyard? <laughs> okay, that is a, uh, that's the plant in the center. There's not much to look at there, but there can be advantages to things like this. That's a um, cat claw mimosa, which is different than the cat claw acacia. 
in the lower deserts. And I know for people who know botany, we don't have acacias anymore. All our acacias were stolen by Australia. I think they got them. There are no more acacias in America, but I don't know. I don't know what the cat claw acacia is, but, um, and that's not what's in this picture. Uh, that was a taxonomy thing that happened several years ago. Any rate, uh, this is cat claw mimosa, and most people hate it for good reasons because it rips you to shred and rips your clothes to the shred, rips your clothes to a shred if you walk through them. But there's, a, there's two types of this there's the um, cat claw mimosa, and there's velvet pod mimosa. Uh, that's cat claw. You can tell it's the cat claw mimosa because the thorns on it, look closely at those thorns, the thorns are curved downward and it has a little white puff ball of a flower, not spectacular, not like the velvet mimosa. The, most, the velvet mimosa has a beautiful, beautiful flower. Butterflies are really attracted to it. But its thorns, there's not a very good thorn shot here, but its thorns stick straight out. So if you see a naked mimosa and the thorns are curved down, it's cat claw mimosa. If the thorns are going straight out, um, it's velvet pod mimosa. When I had a nursery, I had a nursery in Sonoida for a while. And for two weeks out of the year, this plant was flowering and people were coming in. Do you, do you have this plant? Do you have? And I would say, no, and you don't want it. Um, because it's very thorny and it's, I know butterflies like it, but it's thorny and it's very pretty and, you know, but that's two weeks out of the year. But let's think about the, um, go back to the cat claw mimosa for a second. I know there's bird people out there, so that's some, that's a pelican. That's not a pelican. <laughs> I've been told that's a violet crown hummingbird, which is a, a uh, desirable bird to see. So that's a violet crown hummingbird on a cat claw mimosa. If that was a rose bush, that bird would probably not be sitting there. Okay, so that's why we go native because the natives attract native wildlife, birds, butterflies, bees. That's why I just can't stress enough to to stick with the native stuff. Okay, Let's, I'm trying to work in some bird stuff here, folks. I'm trying to work some bird stuff in here. That looks, you know what? I did. I honestly didn't notice this before, but that really looks to me like the velvet pod mimosa that has that green leaf sticking out of it and the straight thorns coming out of it. Um, you bird people are probably looking at an egg in there. That's an egg in an agave, and to be honest, I don't know whether it's the Palmer agave or Huachuca agave. I can't really tell from this picture, but that's an egg from a louder back woodpecker, I am told. And that is a male ladder back woodpecker. I hope that's what that is, feeding its young. So I think they're going to change that name to a woke ladder back woodpecker because the males are chipping in and helping to care for the young. So they're very progressive birds, I hear. All right, enough bad jokes. Um, <laughs> never enough bad jokes, right? Any rate, um, back to the grasses for just a second. This is kind of an important grass that could be used ornamentally, um, but this one right here is um, Bold panic, it's a panic grass. And the panic grass, as you can see on this plant right here, when there's there are some seeds down in the lower right-hand corner, they're large. When you think of um, millet, millet is a panic grass and it has a single large seed. But the main thing that these grasses are, are important is because as the name implies, they grow out of these little bulbs, these little onions, if you dig them up, if you dig up one of these grasses, that's how you can ID this one in particular. Just take a knife and start to shuffle around the bottom of it a little bit. You'll hit these bulbs that are you that are eaten by birds um, as a food source, especially Mern's quail. Now they're not going for bulb panic here, but that was the only shot of the little baby quails. 
that I could find with. And I also believe, and I took this picture yesterday in, in, in the afternoon at my place. Um, those are Gould's turkeys. And I think we have become part of the pub crawl because all of a sudden the past three days, we've been getting these flock of Gould's coming in here. Very fun to see them. There's probably 16 or 17 in the flock. My wife feeds um, finches. And so I'm guessing that there's some food that fell and these guys have found that's easy pickings over there. So that's kind of fun. All right. This is the dark portion of the program here. Um, I would be, what's the right word? I'd be irresponsible to talk about the grasslands without talking about um, invasive species because the invasives have changed and are changing the total makeup of the grasslands very, very quickly. Uh, I've been doing some invasive studies on Fort Huachuca and, and I do a lot of rangeland monitoring in the fall. In the springtime, I'm planning, I'm doing and in the summer, I'm doing revegetation projects. And this time of year in the fall, I'm doing assessment and grazing lands. And I've been on an interesting invasive species um, project on Fort Huachuca. This is layman's love grass. This is the most common invasive plant. And if you look anywhere in Southeast Arizona and you look out among the hills and you see these long, huge patches of yellow, yellowish waving grasses in the breeze. It's probably layman's love grass. It's from Africa. It was imported back in the 20s. We didn't just bring it in. We didn't bring in anything to keep it in control. Soil scientists thought they had something that would do well and they did their job too well. Um, it does very, very, well in our conditions and it outcompetes the natives and livestock and wildlife prefer natives to it. So it's left, they, let me just say livestock prefer natives to laymen. So given a choice, they don't hit it. Given no choice, they will eat it. But that's layman's love grass and its cousin boar's love grass got thicker, more coarse seed heads, another African import. That's weeping love grass. Um, that's more weeping love grass. You can see how both the flower stalks and the leaves weep on it. They're all from the Aragrostis genus, named after Eros, the god of love. And um, I don't know who can, who can not look at these three species and not feel a warm tingling inside. So I guess that's why they're, I guess that's why they're named after the God of love, Eros. <laughs> um, that, yeah. Are all love grasses, is all love bad? No, there's a native love grass, plains love grass, but overall the numbers for that species are going down and the numbers for all these are coming up. And the short explanation for why they are doing so well is that we didn't just import average grasses from similar climates, we brought over the the all-stars. We went to Africa and found grasses that could hold up to huge herds of grazing herbivores and still make it. And we brought them over here. These were the all-stars. These were the Michael Jordans, the Babe Ruths of grasses over in Africa. And we brought them over here and didn't bring, and, and probably wisely didn't bring anything to, to keep them in check and they just tend to thrive in our conditions. Livestock doesn't like them as much as the natives. And as it gets a little hotter and drier, they seem to be outcompeting the natives. So that's most of the love grasses. And then here's a particularly varmintaceous to make up a word. It's a varmint if there ever was one. This is like 
This is a horrible plant. And this is called yellow blue stem. You can see kind of the yellow on the stems. And this is a native to most of the stands out there. Um, Afghanistan, I don't know which stands actually, so I should be quiet. Uh, but it's, I'm told it's a native to the stands. And over there, the only thing that really goes after it are camels. And I haven't seen too many camels roaming, roaming loose lately. And livestock prefer natives and the layman's love grass and the layman's and the other love grasses to this one right here. So livestock really rarely hits this one. I've seen it a few times. I guess if there's absolutely nothing else out there, it's green, they'll go after it. But they really avoid it. And it tends to reproduce by seeds and by runners and makes these thick mats. And it makes conditions like these. You see all that grass in the front, front ground right there? That's all yellow blue stem in an area. Now this is taken on very, the very south of the Baba Comrie Ranch in Elgin. And it's the yellow blue stem has come in and replaced all the natives and it's spreading. I call it the red menace because it, it's just taking over like, like an army. And if you go back, if you're still awake and you remember about that third or fourth slide that I showed you, there were three or four or five grasses in about a five foot square. That's what this ground would have looked like. Now there's one grass in that five foot square. And that's a grass that pretty much no native fauna feeds on or has a use for. Now I will say this about the invasives, just trying to be honest and fair about the whole deal. They tend to hold the ground very, very well. And losing soil is a huge, huge problem, erosion. These things do hold the soil well, but so did the natives before they were outcompeted by this stuff. All right, so hopefully that doesn't bring you down too far. Um, but just think about it. These are some of the things that are that they're that they're replacing and coming in and, and out competing. Southeast Arizona is a super unique environment in that we really have way more in terms of landform and growing conditions. We have way more in common with Mexico than we do the whole rest of the United States. We really, we really are a part of Mexico, and it just happens to be political boundaries that, that, that make things different. Um, and I will show you what I mean. This is a plant right here called um, either Arizona show flower or Mexican showy flower. Um, I guess depending on which side of the line you're on at that point, it grows out of a tuber. Um, just like we talked about the San Pedro daisy. It checks a lot of boxes. Very, very pretty plant, um, but very unique. And these next group of slides that I'm going to show you are, um, I'm, I'm going to prove, I'm going to attempt to prove how unique Southern Arizona is. I'll show you some pretty cool plants and tell you where they occur. Now, I don't know if anybody out there can tell me how many counties there are not in Arizona, not in the Southwest, but in the whole United States, including Alaska and Hawaii, okay? I have no idea. I guess I could have researched that, but um, didn't happen. So might there be a thousand or several thousand counties? Okay, let's, let's stop drawing out that point and we'll get to my point here. The show flower, is found in three counties in Arizona, and they're not sure about New Mexico. That's the only place in the whole United States where it's found. 
That's a cool little plant called Arizona Blue Curls. Arizona Blue Curls is found in four counties in Arizona and three counties in New Mexico. Now, for those of you who have sat through these kind of talks before, and I kind of like to make this point how unique we are, you notice that I'm not using pictures for the most part that I've used before. I went to a whole different set of plants that have the same situation. They're found in very small areas in the United States and, and not the whole rest of the country. Uh, this is a plant that I think has landscape potential. This is obviously shot in the wild, but with a little bit of moisture and um, some cultivation, I think it would probably do real well. A lot of these flowers aren't real big. We have limited resources, mainly water. So a lot of times you can't put a big ostentatious flower on if you only have limited resources, but that's pretty cool. That right there is called, I call it native dichondra. If people who have had lawns in shady places or shady places that needed lawns in other, other parts of the country, uh, the go-to is dichondra. This is a native dichondra. The technical common name for it, I think is something goofy like New Mexico pony's foot or something like that. Um, this is a plant for those of you out there who are ambitious. I have some ideas, but I lack the ambition gene. So most of my ideas don't get carried out and probably the world's a better place because of that. But this is a native dichondra. And a lot of times we spend so much time in landscaping trying to find plants that can take full sun and take heat that we forget about looking for plants that can take shade. This is dichondra, it can take shade. You need any plant to put under a tree, this would work well. So for those of you future nursery people, you might consider mass, mass producing this one right here. Oh, so where does it grow? For us? Believe it or not, it grows in two counties in Arizona, two counties in New Mexico, and Texas claims it has six counties it grows in, okay? There, speaking of economic opportunities, my favorite plant of all time, Mexican oregano. It's a monarda, a bee balm, and it has wonderful flavor. I, I like it better than I like regular oregano. It uh, comes up in the winter time if there's a, a moist winter and flowers in the summer. Flowers probably in August. And a lot of the old Mexican families that I know around here, a lot of my friends, a lot of the parents and grandparents remember as kids going to the hills to pick the oregano. And this is the plant they were looking for. And uh, again, I think there's good commercial, there's really good commercial potential for this plant right here. If you're going to pick it, you don't have to pick the whole thing, by the way. You can just pick some leaves and let the plant go to seed and come back next year. Um, if you're going to pick it, pick it before it gets starts to go to flower. The flavor is still intense, but it's not as sharp, not as peppery as it gets when it starts to flower. I think that means to wildlife, don't eat me. Um, and animals, are animals <laughs> except people, are generally smart enough to understand that. Okay. Another very cool plant. This one's called supine bean. And supine bean, this is a poster child for what we're talking about right now. Supine bean is found in one county. It's found in Santa Cruz County. And that's the whole place, the only place in the whole United States that it's found, okay? Cool thing about this plant, while these flowers up on top are kind of trying to make seed, you can see it's from, a pea fam, from the pea family. While they're trying to make seed underground, just like a peanut, the, the roots are making, the root system is making seed and that seed in the bottom generally has more viability than the seed on the top. The only time I've propagated this plant, it grows out of a tuber. There you go again, another plant that takes in moisture, stores it till it needs it and uses it. Um, and, and if I, you know, dig up a little tuber and, and it transplanted, no problem at all. Found in one county in the whole country. What's next? Zinnia, native Zinnia, Zinnia peruviana. 
Really cool little annual plant, nice butterfly plant. Zinnia Peruviana has the weirdest dispersal rate, the, the weirdest occurrence that I've ever seen in any plant at all. Zinnia, this native Zinnia is found in three counties in Arizona. And in supposedly in North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia. That, that makes no sense to me, but that's what the USDA map said. Really pretty plant. There is one called tufted milkweed. Tufted milkweed, good plant for butterflies, monarchs especially, found in three counties in Arizona, one county in New Mexico, and three counties in Texas. Now, isn't that a cool looking plant? Again, very, very minimal distribution. Here's another one of my favorite plants. This plant is found, let's get this out of the way, three counties in Arizona, one in New Mexico, three counties in Texas. Look at the ground in the background. I mean, it's almost white. This is this little penstemon grows in alkaline conditions. It grows in very alkaline dirt and it flowers in the spring. This penstemon does not show up in most of the penstemon of North America books. And you know you were looking at a at a unusual plant when you Google it. I tried to Google this plant to learn the right spelling on it, and I got the right spelling and typed it in. And Google still said, did you mean, and tried to kick me to another plant. So this is Cochise beard tongue, penstemon dasophilus, I think. Um, Really nice plant. Grows all around the hills in Sonoma. Probably my favorite plant of all. This one's called Mexican star lily. It grows out of a single bulb and it doesn't come up until there's summer rain. And if you see lots of them, there's good summer rain. And if you don't see many of them, there's very poor summer rain. It grows in, wait, don't say it, Jim. Don't say it. You'll give it away. Three counties in Arizona, one county in New Mexico, and they're not sure about Texas. So these are the kind of plants that are being crowded out by invasive species. So what's next? Oh, it's I think it's in the small print in every contract. If you're a presenter or a speaker in other in southern Arizona, you have to go out with a picture of a sunrise or sunset. That's sunrise. I'm a little bit better at six o'clock in the morning than I am at six o'clock in the evening, but that that's uh, that's taken by the biscuit over in the Mustang Mountains. Um, all these pictures, except the two that were fuzzy, were taken by my buddy, Dale Armstrong. If you wanna look at more of his stuff, you go to DGA Photography, Smug mug. You got to put that smug mug in there, um, or you get taken to other places. So, at any rate, that's almost it. But we have special. That was supposed to be the last slide, but because you've been very patient and your birders, we have some bird porn for you. Um, I am told that that's. Let me get this right. A thick-billed cuckoo. No, I'm not thick-billed cuckoo. I'm sorry, thick-billed uh, kingbird unless somebody was pulling my leg. And that shot was taken over by Patagonia Lake. Looks like there's a nest there and it might be in an ash tree. That's about my best guess on that one. And here's the obligatory trogon picture. And I looked at that picture and I stared and stared at that plant in the background before I realized there was a bird in it. But um, I think that's a good one to kind of open it up to. One more question that I, I get asked is how really can you learn to ID these things? And the best way is work with people who know what they're doing and they will share their knowledge. The second best way is buy my book. <laughs> so um, it's available wherever it's sold. Uh, you can go to like it's a I got a website either look at, look up my name or Arizona Revegetation. Uh, or monitoring co and monitoring company. It's, there's a website about that. And it's also available at the big dogs, but, um, and, and a lot of the local places have it too and support them. You know, um, 
A lot of the local bookshops have it. The feed store has it in Sonoida. So at any rate, we appreciate you all paying attention. And I sure hope you got some questions for me, okay? So I'm gonna stop the share and see where we're going on here. All righty, oh my gosh. So. Thank you very much, those... Jim. That okay. Was a fabulous, fabulous talk. Wonderful illustrations, we really enjoyed it. And yeah, we're getting some questions in now. We have a question from Joanne. One moment, just give me a second. Okay, Joanne. Joanne, would you like to answer live? You can turn your microphone on. It's on. Uh, <clears throat> hi, uh, Jim, it's Joanne. Hope you're doing well. Um, hey, I just Joanne, good to hear your voice. It was great seeing you. It's a great presentation. Really appreciate being here today. Um, I you. wanted to ask you, in, ob in observing um, the grasses, the invasives that when you were talking about layman's, um, doesn't layman's actually fare better during this drought? Because um, we observed that the layman's was doing fine, even though the rain was so poor, um, while the natives were struggling really terribly this season. And um, the livestock and some of the wildlife that we observed were eating um, the love grass. Yeah, you're yeah, exactly right, Joanne. Um, Native uh, layman's is better equipped to deal with these hotter, drier, harsher conditions than the natives are. And so, um, and so it's thriving and flowering. They, I wouldn't say it's thriving this year because I've actually seen patches of it here and there that have droughted out. And when it's droughted, you know, I mean, when conditions are bad enough to drought out layman's, you know they're bad. But when you're in patches where it's just kind of coming in, it might be flowering and all the natives around it may or may not be flowering. Um, and it's also got a lot of other advantages to it too. Uh, I've been told that the seed on layman's is viable for up to 40 years. And so it, it's, it's, it's very, very tough to get rid of. Well, and if you're a livestock um, producer and you want to limit the amount that you're uh, feeding, um, you know, uh, without um, just free range grazing, then what would dissuade uh, ranchers, whether it's, you know, goat, pig, or cattle, um, what would dissuade them from maintaining layman's and like when they do cover crops, put in something uh, that's more native? What would dissuade them from planting layman's? Is that the question? Yeah, or keeping it as opposed to when they're doing um, vegetation management projects, not to reseed with uh, natives. Yeah, the, the, I don't know anybody who's actually planning it right now. I think it has a bad enough reputation. <laughs> um, it's, it's not going anywhere. It, when I'm working with ranchers, the, the common advice is learn to manage it. And the best strategy for managing it is simply to hit it very, very hard in the springtime when it is palatable. And that takes the, the stress off of the natives. And that's really all that you can do. And as long as it's hotter and dry, as long as it keeps getting hotter and drier, it's not going anywhere. The best, and, and I might lose a lot of friends when I say this, but the best that we can really hope for are small patches that can be maintained. Like I, you know, I'm on six acres, a little better than six acres out here. And I try to manage my property, even though I'm not grazing anything, for natives. So I'll go out and hand dig or whatever and get rid of the invasives that, and just have this small patch. You can have a patchwork where the natives are still hanging in, but, but layman's just really is not going to go anywhere. Um, natives know they get, I mean, sorry, most ranchers know you get better production out of the natives. So you try to manage for the natives as much as possible, uh, but layman's is not going anywhere. Thanks, Jim. That's um, uh, answered my question very well. Thank you very much. I sure took a long time. I took a real scenic route to get to that answer, didn't I? I don't expect anything else. Appreciate it. <laughs> Thanks, Joanne. <laughs>
Good one. Thank you for your question, Joanne. That was really very interesting, all your questions. And Jim, I have a question. We uh, we live in uh, on our property with lots of different grasses. And what would you say is the best way that we can get rid of the layman's love grass, which is pretty present here? Well, that's, that's going to be a personal decision on your part. Some people spray, some people don't spray. Um, if you're willing to spray with a glyphosate, that's the best way to get rid of layman's, the easiest way to get rid of it. If you're not, start digging it up. But the key to any plant mitigation project, let's call it, is maintenance. It's just like getting married. You know, everybody has the big wedding and the big ceremony and you think, that's it. I'm set for the rest of my life. <laughs> but um, as Chris might tell you, it's all about the maintenance. <laughs> and so uh, I'm on, uh, you know, I've been involved in several uh, mesquite eradication projects to begin with, or just, you know, shrub eradication where shrubs have moved in and taken over what was historical grasslands and people are trying to reestablish grasslands. And you can come in and do all you want that first year, but unless you maintain it, you could take every, you could go dig every layman's plant you have in your yard out, but you still have all that seed laying there. The good news is it does get easier theoretically year to year to year, but you have to stay on top of it and maintain it. Right, yeah, we're worried about spraying because we also have a lot of native grasses um, mixed in with everything. Yeah. Exactly. I, I've gone, I don't spray much here on my place anymore. Uh, I prefer to dig them out. I know it's the slow route, but yeah. I, I just prefer to go that route. Seems like a very zen uh, thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> well, but you know, but realistically, if you're on a thousand acres, you're not going to be digging it out. You have to find right. a more effective, you know, so I'm all about finding the lightest effective method, but I do emphasize effective. It's got to work. Right, right, right. Thank you so much. Yeah. yeah. And we've had one or two um, people asking whether it's possible to get a list of the species that you've mentioned and include not just the, uh, the, the common names, but the scientific names as well. Um, I'm not probably good enough to, to go through and do all this myself. Is that something you could prepare? We could email it to people. Uh, a list of things on the slides. Yeah, we can do that. Brilliant. That'll be wonderful. Especially if they're not really in a hurry, we can do that. Okay. <laughs> Good. Are yeah, there any, that sounds great. Any more questions out there, people? Seems like we're good. Uh, okay. Hey, I, I just wanted to, to, I just wanted to mention um, that uh, Jim's native seed. Um, product from Arizona Revegetation is available at Ace Hardware here in Sierra Vista. Oh, good to know. So, yeah, so it has the whole list of the uh, native species um, that's included in that seed source. Okay. That's very good and to know. At the Ace in Sierra Vista, great. Thanks, John. Yeah, I mean, that is a good question. If, if we're looking for a source of native plants, be they grasses or anything else, where are the best places uh, in this area to, 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 to get things? To get the source for native seeds, um, the, it's a little bit hard to find, but um, I do try to keep some places stocked. And native seed is, tends to be more expensive than people are, if you're used to dealing with rye or fescue, but it goes farther. Um, we could spend a lot of time talking about seeding, but use a blend and not a single species. But to answer your question, uh, Ace in Sierra Vista has it. Um, the feed store in Sonoida has it. Um, I know I'm forgetting a bunch of places that keep it stocked. Um, wow. I'm sorry. It's, it's on my website. I, and and I'm, I'm not just trying, I'm not trying to... Uh, not trying to hog it, but I, I'm pretty, you know, around Southeast Arizona, I, I wholesale some to places and it's not a, you know, you don't go into the big box hardware stores and find it. Okay. Okay, well, thank you very comments. much. Okay, I just, I was looking at the comments. I see Cassandra's on there. Hi, Cassandra, I didn't. And I also saw that somebody, um, 
said there are 3,143 counties in the U.S. So that's pretty amazing. And if I had known we were dealing with really educated people, I'd have raised the humor level just a little bit. Not much, but that was impressive. Thank you, Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Jim. And if any of you Everybody. missed the beginning of Jim's talk, the whole talk has been recorded and it will be making it available probably later on today or tomorrow morning on the Southwest Wings website, which is swwings.org. Um, and also we've set up a YouTube channel now and uh, Jim's recording will be available um, on our website for 30 days. Um, and then we're going to put it onto our YouTube channel with your permission, Jim, so that people can watch it and enjoy your pearls of wisdom for many, many more months to come. <laughs> Good. Well, thank you very much, Jim. Uh, next month, thank we're you. going to welcome thank you, Jim. Diane um, Hadley uh, on January the 27th, Wednesday, 27th of January, 11 a.m. as usual. And she'll be talking about the Northern Jaguar Prod project, which is looking at how to protect basically the northernmost jaguars, which um, occasionally do make it up into this part of the world. Yeah. So very much looking forward to that. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's about right, rounds it up for everyone. So yeah. um, all I've really got to say is goodbye from me, I'm Chris Harbard. And goodbye from me, I'm Mary Sia, and goodbye to Jim and everybody for joining us. Thank you so much. We wish you all a very, very happy, healthy, healthy New Year. year. Yeah. <laughs> Bye now. Thanks, folks. Bye. Thanks to Southwest Wings, too. Thank Thanks, you, Jim. Jim. Thanks for all your support. Yeah. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. See you next year.